So we don't want to get fixated on the structure. We want to get fixated on the expertise behind that structure. Hello, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 448. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Master Colin Wee. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. And I found you Whistlekick. And what is Whistlekick? Well, we are a company dedicated to supporting you, the traditional martial artist, whether that be through content like this show or through products like our protective equipment and uniforms and apparel and all that jazz. And if you want to see that jazz, go to whistlekick.com, jump into the store, and if you make a purchase, be sure to use the code PODCAST15. That'll get you 15% off. And it reminds us, it lets us know that people listening to this show care and they're willing to support what we're doing. And we're doing it twice a week. We bring you a guest interview on Mondays. And on Thursdays, we bring you some kind of a topic show. Maybe it's just me. Maybe we bring a guest on to talk about something specific. But hopefully you find some enjoyment and hopefully it betters your experience as a martial artist. That's why we're doing it. One of my favorite things about this show is that as we've grown, we're reaching martial artists all over the world. And we have guests from all over the world. And today's guest checks a few boxes. Born in one country, moved to another country, then moved to another country, and is now residing there, training, teaching. And despite a pretty big time shift, we had a great conversation. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with today's guest. Here we go. Master Wee, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate this. We've we've got a little bit of a of a time shift. You're on the other side. I am. Are you? Um, it's now nine o'clock at night, and I have decided to put on some uh, work clothes to sit and talk with you. <laughs> Which li- li- listeners know that very rarely do we have anything involving video. This isn't this is an audio show, and <laughs> right. you know what? I did the same thing. I took a shower. I yeah. shaved. I put okay. on you know. Profe- not professional clothes, but in, in my world, professional clothes, you know, actual pants <laughs> Very good. to talk yeah. to you. Here it is. It's nine in the morning. We, we, we couldn't be further apart. Yeah. Yeah. That 12 hour shift. But I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here and, and it's a little bit late for you. So thank you for doing that. Always a challenge when we talk to our folks uh, down under. Thank you. And, make, and making this work. So yeah, thank you. Now let's Let's start. Let's go back to the root, the place mm. that we 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 have mm. to go here. I mean, it's it's hard mm. not to, and that's mm. it's about your beginning in the martial arts. You know, we're going to talk about a lot of things martial arts related, yeah. but yeah, we don't have our basics. Yeah, it's hard to really get context. So, how'd you find martial arts? Well, um, I am calling you from Perth, Western Australia, but uh, I am Singaporean. So when I I first started martial arts, basically it was as a kid in Singapore. Uh, hooked on a diet of uh, wuxia inspired shows uh green green hornet and kato mm. and um you know i my my wife jokes that you know i didn't have very much going on in my life so they, those are probably the the main things that kept me entertained and um certainly uh there were those heroes on the on the screen and uh we just were hooked on them my friends and i and uh they were confident they were strong they were capable uh everything i wasn't I, I didn't actually identify myself as as being the hero of the show but i, I was basically memorized mesmerized and um eventually in year seven basically in high school a friend of mine said hey would you like to actually have me introduce you to my master I go yeah this is great man i, I would love to uh we took a a, a trip to see his instructor and there was no such thing as, oh, okay, let's go ahead and research different instructors. Let's see what we want from the martial arts. What is, what is the goal here? There's no such thing. Basically, he had a, a link. He brought me along, and uh, that's how it started. Uh, it's a small group. I was, I was very, very lucky to actually be trained in a very, very small training group. It was an eclectic style uh, mixed with Chinese martial arts and Korean martial arts at the time. And uh, yeah, I just stuck with it. I just felt that um, the training was appropriate for what I wanted to achieve with myself. 
it was fun. My friends were doing, I was doing it. It was great stuff. Right? We, we would train uh, maybe twice or three times a week, come to school, uh, exchange ideas with other martial arts students. And basically it was the most fun I had in, in high school. Now, as you're watching these movies and, and mm. seeing what's going on, you're, you're building up an idea of what martial arts is. Mm. Everybody seems to have these, these preconceived mm. notions. These, mm. Some of them are fantasy, some are more practical of what you would experience when you started training. And just from the way you, you expressed it, the, this high school friend said, hey, mm. I want to introduce mm. you to my instructor. You sounded excited. Mm. So it mm. sounded like there was something you were hoping to find when you started training. And did you find it? Well, um, when I was a kid, basically, I, I had a really bad eating culture. So I was, I was fat. I was unfit. Um, I was not happy with my physical fitness. And obviously not really too excited about the exclusion and, you know, the, the taunts in school. I, I wouldn't say that I was bullied, but I certainly felt some, some level of isolation. Um, in year six, basically, I started a, a portion control diet for myself and I started a little bit of exercise and the, the pounds started dropping off and I, I started actually losing quite, quite a bit of weight. Um, the, the recommendation to that martial arts school was uh, just the right time when I actually felt that, you know, I, I could do something beyond what I, I've always been able to do, which was very, very little. Uh, so as I as I explored it and I, I stuck with it, um, certainly I, I thought that, hey, you know, there were some days where the, the training was really tough, but, you know, by and large, I mean, I, I looked around, everybody was experiencing the same level of difficulty. Uh, we had a small group, so there was nowhere to really hide in that group. The training was tough, but I, there, there are some strengths that I had in terms of being able to recognize a, a, a technique learn the sequences, coordinate myself so that I don't look too much like a fool. So aside from the cardiovascular issues and, and the fitness level, I suppose my, my fit into the group was, was fairly decent. And I was really enjoying the training. So I, I'm there now, I'm looking at the, the content of the syllabus and I, I say that, hey, he is training us. We've got six students and we're running the gamut of Unarmed combat throws some locks, some weapons, and um, this you know matches with and places us quite favorably with the other people practicing other martial arts like karate or taekwondo or aikido. And um, I, I definitely felt that uh, I was gaining from from the training. I didn't feel as though I wanted more. I felt that it was appropriate for what I wanted to do and uh, appropriately cha challenging. So, you know. As a kid, I really, I had very low expectations of what I, I really wanted or know what I want. And um, I was really grateful for my first instructor putting in his time and being generous with his, um, his, his skills. And, you know, growing us up slowly as, as um, his young black belts and basically his last class that he actually his last group that he actually trained before he actually retired. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And what about now? We're, we're going to go back. We're going to fill in lots of details. But yeah. When you think about your training now versus then, mm. what, what's the biggest difference? Okay. So real quick, Jeremy, yeah. you've not read up anything about me, have you? I haven't. Okay, great. So, and, and, and I, let, me, let me jump in because I explained this to you ahead and okay. I just want to make sure in yes. case we have yes. new listeners. And, and so yes. to the listeners, most interviewers yep. research. I don't. And that's yep. intentional. Okay. It's, not, it's not laziness. And, it's because and that's, the listeners yep. aren't going to research. Mm. And I want to be able to give as good an interview as I can. And I think that putting myself yep. in the position of the listener is better than yep. trying to be an yep. expert on you. Yeah. So please. Okay. All right. So... Let me kind of, um, kind of fill in the gaps for you. So okay, from yeah. Singapore, I, I passed out as, as a, a, a young black belt. I did my army training in Singapore, and then I left for college in the U.S. When I got to the U.S., basically, I, I studied at SMU, 
um, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. I joined the SMU Martial Arts Club um, under uh, what was then called the uh, Southwest Taekwondo Organization or Association, currently called uh, AKTO, which is American Karate and Taekwondo Organization. So I spent four or five years there training under their system, American Karate, uh, before then graduating, going back to Singapore, and then finally getting married and then moving to Australia. So when you ask about what my current training is like, my current training is very, very different from when I first started. So when I first started, it was a very eclectic system. It was, um, you could think about it as kind of like a, 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 a taekwondo mixed with a little Chinese martial arts, some weaponry, uh, some throwing skills, right? Mm -hmm. When I went to the States, it was uh, a system called American Karate. My teacher also trained in Aikido, so I, I learned Aikido. And then from there, basically, I moved in. And when I established myself here in Australia, I, I did so with the syllabus that I brought back from uh, AKTO, which is, is uh, American Karate and Taekwondo. Um, when I took a look at the syllabus, basically, I then, <laughs> because I was really far away from my teachers, I took some liberties with the training methodology. The, the legacy in which I, I received, I basically felt that that was a gift in which I, I receive and I, I persevere and I promote and I, I preserve it. But beyond that, what I do is I explore the martial arts based off of what I feel the traditional techniques are trying to teach us. So in my philosophy, there's a structure that's typically used to transmit expert information. So we don't want to get fixated on the structure. We want to get fixated on the expertise behind that structure. So there's a, there's a guy who's created a pattern set. That pattern set is what I hold. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to link myself through the pattern set as a lens back to those experts that are trying to create the, the martial arts legacy that I basically am promoting, right? Or I, I, at least I hope. Mm. So at, at, uh, at present, basically, I run a small boutique martial arts school. I use the word boutique, but basically it really is a very small group. Um, in Perth, Western Australia, I've got links with uh, my, you know, organization back in Dallas, and I've networked really well with quite a number of local schools here in Western Australia, plus I'm linked with a whole bunch of international martial artists across the world. Uh, so where I have a, a very small practice, the practice enjoys a huge amount of, of links to other schools, other styles, and um, I suppose in a way I am trying to, to, I say be the poster boy of traditional taekwondo, meaning I, I see that there is a, a cultural legacy and I feel like sometimes I am a museum curator, right? And I take my system and I go, hey, there's something that I would love to share and I would love to actually link with other people who share the same passion. So I, I, I go and hopefully I represent traditional Taekwondo and the American Karate and Taekwondo organization as well as I can. Now, I, I can't say for certain that you're the first person that we've talked to that has done this, but you're certainly in the mm. minority and that you started mm. with an eclectic uh, mashup, fusion, blended, yep. whatever you, people choose yep. to call it, style. Mm. And you went more traditional, more specific. Much much more I so, mean, a yes. complete 180. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to dig into why. When, when did you first start to think, you know, I've got all of these things that I'm doing, I'm teaching all of these things that I've learned from my time training in, in multiple countries, multiple instructors, but I want to focus on traditional Taekwondo. When I did think, you have that thought? I, I think the question of why is actually really important. And I... I got prompted to think that way. I, I don't want to, I want to speak bad about my, any of my experiences, but I, I am back in the States and I'm learning this system. And I want to know what we're doing. And the question is, what really are we doing? 
And that question has, has been with me for a very, very long time. Um, the first initial uh, interaction was when I, after about a year or two when I was in the States, basically I was, I, I was learning Japanese there and I figured out, hey, you know, the patent names are not kata and are not called by, by Japanese names that I can recognize. What's going on there? So I started asking. And then I got told that American karate is not really American. It's not really karate, but it's traditional taekwondo. The, the name American karate is just a label that's put on the system because people didn't really understand what taekwondo was. So karate was a term that everybody understood. So American karate was um, basically a generic uh, uh, name for the system that we practice. Uh, fast forward a few years, I'm back in Australia. I have my syllabus in hand and I'm looking at it. And from my perspective as a teacher, I'm like thinking, what am I teaching here? I've got a, a, a collection of patterns. I've got a, a, a grading activities that I, I have to include. I've got uh, Kihon or Kibon, which is the basics. And when I, when I, and I look at it, I'm like going, this doesn't really reflect all of the training that I received over the years. And so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying, hey, I've got to do better than that. You know, it's like my, my teachers have taught me so much. And basically this sheet of paper is not providing me the link. And, I, and I'm, I'm curious as to what I could do to improve the, the teaching of it. And uh, this was uh, 2002, 2003. I made a few connections online that were probably, uh, that, that were with, with instructors that were probably at the same uh, stage as I was in developing the same thoughts and trying to figure out their place in the greater scheme of things. And one of my immediate priorities were, was not really to teach blindly what i wanted to do was to organize and to make um sense of a system by using the pattern set as my base syllabus so rather than a list of of techniques per belt rank i saw the the, the patterns as the framework for what i needed to communicate expertise or experience. I'm kind of chortling a little bit about myself, but in terms of the expertise and experience, it's basically that it's, it's an opportunity for myself to um, try to share a little bit of my insight and perspective with people trying to grow in my system. So in 2003, I made a switch. So I, you know, until then I was actually training my students the way I was trained. In 2003, I said to myself, I said, I'm going to go about this in a very goal-oriented manner. The techniques basically need to be drawn from the patterns which are set for the rank. When I teach, I'm going to be rank appropriate. And what I want to do is I want to append skills and insight through the drills by patterns. Right? And the, the changes that I, I was doing was goal-oriented, meaning I would say, okay, great. Well, I need to introduce, for instance, uh, a yellow belt, orange belt to sparring. And I go, well, I don't, you know, just send him into the ring and get beaten up. Basically, I want to be able to talk about the components of what I want them to do, build it up from there so that they're not thrown blindly into an arena to flounder, right? And that was what I felt my club was, um, was, uh, was, was, was doing to improve the training of rank beginners, pulling them up through the ranks in a, I suppose you want to think about it, a, a gentle and nurturing fashion. And as they go through their training, there are certain event horizons, which I thought in my mind would, would then, um, uh, uh, identify them and categorize them between what they started off as beginners to when they become intermediates, when they become senior students and then black belts. 
and I went from there. So uh, when I I look at the um, when I look at that progression, basically my want to use the patterns as the syllabus and the structure was linked to the fact that hey, they were the most cogent or structured way that techniques are, are organized within my martial arts system. There are some martial arts systems that don't have so many patterns or, or so many techniques for pattern. But for me, it's like, this is what I have. And what I need to do is I need to make the, the training methodology complement the set of patterns that I've got, All right? And that's where I am, yeah. You're not the first person to just wholesale and make a shift in the curriculum that you're teaching. Mm. But most schools don't go through that. No. What was the response from your student? That's a really good question. Um, the students, I've got to say, they some of them did come from other martial arts. Uh, they did have uh, other training. They weren't children. Uh, they were adults. And I've got to say, I'm very grateful that they were patient with me, that they were willing to play. They, um, they did experience difficulty in the growth and the, the, the nature of the changes that we had to do. Like, for instance, if you are trained in a, a, a classical heart style, Kihon Kata Kumete method, which is the way that I was actually trained in, and then you look at the way that we currently train in, it is a huge paradigm shift. Uh, we, we basically, if, if, I, if I were to, to compare, if I, I, if, I, if I focus on the Kihon Kata Kumite, that would probably make up five to 10% of my overall syllabus. 80 to 90% or more of my, my training approach is very different, very fluid. Uh, it focuses on variations. It focuses on skills and drills. And um, we don't necessarily schedule that progression for the whole entire class. We, we try to look at the individual, we try to look at what the individual needs. So I, you know, for many, time, many times, I basically look back at my students and I'm going, man, without them, I would not have been able to experiment. They're, they're actually my pack rats, right? <laughs> my lab rats, sorry, not pack rats, but they're my lab rats. And I've basically experimented on them. And fortunately, my goodness, we came up with some real golden nuggets and uh, I'm actually really pleased with where we've, we've done so. So we started doing that in 2002, 2003, and um, I would come into class and the intermediates or senior students at the point uh, would then hear me say, okay, today we're going to, for instance, we are going to do a sparring session, right? And the sparring session is set in this way you guys can't attack all you've got to do is defend and one group of your opponents can attack you with everything that they've got and what you can do is you can attack but you can defend but by basically covering slipping rolling moving controlling your floor space uh, and that's basically what you are focusing on today and, in fact, for the rest of the month, right? And, and really, it's very challenging. For instance, there was once, basically, very, very early on, I, I came in, I looked at the, the senior students and I looked at the, the, the beginners and the intermediates and I said, okay, the beginners and intermediates, when you spar, you can only use punches to attack. You can defend, but you can't use anything else to attack with. And what my goal there was, was to reduce the amount of clutter in their head. And in my head, in my plan, I saw somebody with a hammer and everything became a nail. And I wanted them to be really proficient with close range quarter punching and long range punches, right? So I would set them up in a sparring scenario and Everybody gets to use any technique, but the beginners and the intermediates basically can only use punches. 
And I, I, I was looking at this one exchange and I was like going, the senior students are actually panicking that the, the, the anxiety level has risen. They feel challenged because they know that come, come the, the engagement or encounter and if there's proximity, those beginners and intermediates, all they're focusing on is a punch, right? And I'm looking at them and I'm like going, holy cow, I've basically, you know, discovered something. I've discovered that I can actually focus on skills and I can basically get people to learn a specific skill whilst modifying the, the scenarios in which we actually roll out our training. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's really exciting. And I was sitting back there and I, I'm having a, a real great time because you know, as an instructor, I, I want the best for my students. And at that point in time, I'm like thinking, yeah, the senior students aren't really having a, walk, a stroll in the park. They've now got to really be careful. Otherwise, they're going to get their faces smashed. Right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done some drills like this and I've, I've done some instruction similar to this and, mm. and come mm. to a, a very similar um, realization. Mm. And I, I think it comes from, and I'm curious if, if you agree, you know, we start students off, you know, day one, we give them, you know, two or three techniques and then, mm. you know, subsequent classes, they get, you know, maybe one new technique each class or something. Yeah. And we mm. give them a lot of structure, a lot of structure, a lot of structure. And then we throw them mm. into something freestyle whether mm. that be, you know, grappling or, or sparring, you know, yep. whatever the context is. Yep. And they are so overwhelmed by the options. Mm. And that by simplifying the options and saying, you only get to punch. Yep. They end up understanding, okay, I can punch from here. I can't punch from here. And it leaves the others, the senior students, avoiding getting their face smashed in. Because even though they know yep. that punch is coming, yep. Yep. It's, it comes with so much more intent and understanding mm, mm, because they, mm, they're not distracted. Mm, they're not overwhelmed. Mm, mm. I think, I think the, the issue here, and, and it's actually, it mirrors my experience and, and my, uh, um, uh, my insight in, into the martial arts. Hard style training is very, very difficult. You, it's hard to actually break free from the structure. And in fact, you can see a lot of this in YouTube. You, you know, these hard style instructors there, they're trying to do the best. They're trying to showcase their martial arts they're trying to um, uh, share applications or skills that are beyond their system. But it seems to me what they're doing is they are trying to justify technique upon technique uh, the, and the extent in which their lexicon of techniques is huge and fulfilled and brimming with insight and wisdom and i'm like going they can't be serious what they're, they're thinking of is the more that they know the better that they are and as they progress they actually transcend their heart style training and become something like steven seagal right i mean for me i'm like going hey you know that's not that's not the, the core of what we're doing the problem here is that there is a student and that student is human the, the, the human basically will succumb to stress. And in a stressful situation, what you need to do is have mnemonics. You need to solidify uh, a, a simple decision framework. You need to gift them with the ability to perform under duress. And your system needs to support um, their ability to perform with uh, a huge amount of um, non-compliance so in fact this is what jdk is i mean really when, when i summarize what jdk is quickly jdk for me is and the, judo, basically jdk means judo, judo kwan judo kwan for me uh, is three things one is that we train our practitioners or students um, to uh, deal with predictable expected attacks the second is that we want to reuse and recycle our applications. And third, we want to be able to um, basically counter or recover from when we fail or when we are, 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 are stopped by an obstacle in front of us. 
So I don't really claim to be all things to all people. And, and sometimes people um, in their reflection of, of, my, of, of my role or my place in the greater scheme of things, they go, oh, hey, man, Colin, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I would actually hesitate to, to explain my viewpoint because I want to simplify things. I want to be able to solve problems. I want to solve the human condition. And the human condition is that we are able to only think maybe two or three steps ahead as hard stylists. In, in my training experience, we, we, we solve things two to three steps ahead, not 10 to 20 steps ahead. Uh, we need to simplify. We need to have techniques that can be applied whether or not you throw a left attack or a right attack. Um, or if you guess that you have thrown a left attack and unfortunately the right attack has come, you can actually recover from that problem and then basically hopefully shut it down and get the hell out of there. Or if you're stopped, then you need to then have the skills to bring the person back into uh, um, your game where you're playing to your strengths and you either take him down, uh, neutralize the threat or basically get out of there. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, um, I, I, Judah Kwan is not all things to all people. So when I actually do go for seminars, when I go do, uh, when I do uh, cross training endeavors, basically I tell everybody is like, I am trying to talk about a concept. Sometimes what I show may not actually gel with what you understand. What you need to do is then use what I have as inspiration to um, lift your game instead of basically following me. And, you know, with what I have, basically, it may not actually even fit what you think of the world and, and, and solve the issues that you think you have. So that's, that's where I come in. It's, like it's, it's always, for me, uh, whether or not I can um, answer my students' issues. And when I talk about, for instance, basics as opposed to fundamentals, I talk about the basics of my system. And when I talk about fundamentals, I talk about what are those things in my system that are popular with myself and my students because they're easy to do and they fit amongst the, the circle of skills that we usually work on, all right? So that, therein is, is a slight difference between, I, I suppose, what I'm doing uh, to try to expand on uh, the legacy that I have. And also, I, I suppose, try to be um, uh, honest and obviously uh, sincere to the, the legacy of the, the patterns that I've, I basically uh, have with, with uh, the traditional Taekwondo. For the people that are, that are listening, when you say traditional Taekwondo, where do you track that back to? Because we've, okay. we've, we've got a pretty hard fork in yeah. there. So 1956, so 1955, 1956, GM Junri, Grandmaster Junri brought over a Chundokwan lineage from South Korea. And he basically set up shop with uh, Grandmaster Alan Steen, uh, just about five minutes away from where I trained in Dallas. And he trained uh, Chundokwan, which is basically classical Japanese karate. Right, uh, Chung Do Kwan would have forms like the Pyong Ans or the He Ans, and they would correspond to what Chodokan practitioners would actually uh, train in today. So they would have the, the five He Ans, and they would have black belt forms like Basai, uh, um, Teki, they would have the Jite Jion and Jian. And then uh, in the late 1960s, um, General Choi, as he was touring the U.S., convinced GM Junri to adopt Taekwondo as a name rather than using American karate or karate, right? Or Korean karate. So from the late 1960s, basically, they converted to using American Taekwondo as a way to identify what they were doing. And then in the late 1960s, which is, I believe, 1967, uh, General Che converted uh, GM Junri's students um, 
and I believe it was uh, uh, my grandmaster Keith Yates who um, helped convert his school to using the Cheng Hong pattern set, which is basically the early Taekwondo patterns that uh, GM, sorry, General Che was touring the US with at that time. So the um, system in which we practice had those forms. We train um, with forms that would probably um, place us around the first or second dan level uh, that ITF Taekwondo uses today. We also have some old forms from the um, Chung Dukwang lineage, like uh, Teki, which we call Chuji, and Basai, which is Basai Dai. We also have this uh, form called Sipsu, which basically is Jite, or, or the um, Jite, uh, the, the, the temple kata of Shotokan uh, uh, forms. So within our black belt level, we actually have some leftover legacy form from the Shotokan days or Chungdukwan days. That, yeah. that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how forked martial arts can be. And even if we look at something that's in the grand scheme of martial arts, a bit on the newer side, like Taekwondo, mm. Mm. There, there are a lot of offshoots. And uh, you know, for, for anybody that's interested, we did have Grandmaster Rhee on the show years ago before he passed away. Mm. Uh, that's episode mm -hmm. 180. Anybody wants to check that out? I think the issue here is, is that um, I, I did actually mention before I felt like a museum curator. Yeah. So when I actually received these forms, basically they were a gift. They were part of training. I thought that they were a waste of time when I actually started learning them. <laughs> and um, Just those forms or all forms? All forms, basically. I mean, why do we want to actually do this? It's such a waste of time, right? Uh, for me, basically the forms eventually became my link with a rich heritage and that heritage can be traced and in fact they were they were brought over to the us in the mid 1950s which basically places me uh, with a lineage that is older than the itf and wtf organizations so you know often now I, I i face remarks that say hey hey you know that's a really good variation of that form and i go that's not the variation mate you know, that is the form or, or the original version of that form in, from the 1950s. Um, certainly, I don't claim legitimacy. I basically claim that it's an interesting snapshot and it's a great story to tell. And um, my experience with uh, traditional Taekwondo or, uh, or what I, I have received through the American Karate and Taekwondo organization is a gift because the people that gave it to me and trained me were such inspiring and motivational um, people, instructors. And for me, basically, that is the most important thing. I, I, I can't say that I, I shared, you know, the, the book, The Killing Art. I can't say I, I shared any of that experience. Uh, it, it, that, that book portrays a, you know, a somewhat negative view of, of Taekwondo and its, its history. And I, I never experienced any of that. And for me, it's like I have a really good space in my heart and I say, hey, these forms basically were brought to me by pioneers in the field of, um, of Taekwondo as it started in the States, as the, fa the father of Taekwondo brought it over from Korea. And certainly, I, you know, I don't hold on to... Um, Obviously, the nationalistic difficulties between Korea and Japan, I, I don't have that lens. And I do respect that they had a very difficult history, the coins. And the more I, I, I understand of it, I, the more I feel as though it is my responsibility to represent uh, this Korean heritage, and I suppose uh, an American heritage as, as best as I can, as opposed to saying that, hey, you know, I've got a link with Japan. You know, that's my heritage. No, I, I say that my heritage is quite close to Korea and America. But then again, also, it links me very close to Japanese karate and then a hop back to Okinawan karate. And for me, I, um, I am here in 21st century Australia. I, I'm not in the outback, but basically... Uh, 
I have a system that was uh, gifted to me from the mid 1950s that links me all the way back to 18th century Okinawa. And I go, you know, that's a really compelling story and one in which I can actually share. And I say, hey, we can trace our lineage backwards. We have skills that we, uh, we learn and we innovate and we actually grow today. And it's not that as it goes, it dilutes itself. That's not, that's not it. It is as we grow, we enrich it. And as we enrich it, basically, this thing becomes its own animal. We basic, it basically takes a life of its own. It, 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 uh, it grows as, as, uh, as we grow. And, and I think that that is, is very important to me because very often in this world, a post-UFC world, people are always asking, hey, why do you actually practice what you're practicing when you know MMA would kill you or the latest trend, Krav Maga would kill you? I'm like, okay, well, you know, back in the day, in my estimation, hard star martial arts were the Krav Maga of their day. If you fixate the training, obviously it fixates at the weakest link, but I'm growing it and I really benefit from it. Um, and in, in terms of where I, I, I see the training, am I going, the relevance is that there, there's a richness in this heritage that many organizations, including MMA type organizations, are not able to, um, to deliver because as a, as a traditional instructor, I'm not only just focusing on a technical uh, level, I'm not just focusing on a striking skills base for my, my students. I am looking at the whole entire individual. I want them to understand the history, the philosophy, the technical skills, certainly the legacy, um, obviously the tactics as well. Uh, I am happy to say, as you say, I'm not everything to everybody. There, there are skills that I have, there are skills that I lack. But in the end, basically, I know as, as a 49 year old aging martial artist that. I am actually a really well-rounded individual. My martial arts is actually really fairly good. It places me in a in, in good stand. And I've got something to offer. And I think that, you know, as we actually look at the 21st century, there are people out there who need this training, who are desperate for this training, and who would say, um, who basically don't have uh, that nurturing from other organizations that you typically face as you're growing up in the world. Uh, my my uh, analogy typically, I, I know I have some uh, young children uh, who, who study with me and I go, hey, that tennis that you do in school, that tennis is just basically only wanting to optimize you for tennis. If you get injured, you know, you're going to fall by the wayside. They're not going to be able to actually rehabilitate you. You come to martial arts training. I'm going to teach you more than just what you're going to get from that sports organization. Obviously, that's simplifying, and I was joking a little bit. But what, what I mean to say is that I am concerned for the individual to grow not only from a very narrow bandwidth of skills. I want them to actually take those skills and grow with it in order to actually become I suppose, uh, as, as, um, as well-rounded a practitioner as possible. And that's what JDK is to me. When we hear people talking about being well-rounded or, or the personal mm. development aspects of martial arts, mm. we tend to see people start to bring back in or at least have had a change of heart around their opinion on forms. You know, you talked about mm. how originally with patterns that you... You know, you weren't down with it. It didn't, it mm. seemed like a waste of time. But yeah. now that you've gone back and now that what you're, what you're teaching, what you're trying to build up in people is not mm. simply fighting ability, yeah. now forms come back in. Mm. And I just, I find it interesting that that, that seems to happen every time. I, I, I don't, I don't it's know of, to, any, of a counter yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's probably somebody out there, but at least overall, the majority of people who are trying to well, make people better people yeah. use forms yeah. in there somewhere. Well, 
I think, you know, um, modern day practitioners and instructors, they look at forms as uh, drudgery. Uh, I certainly was there and I, I basically experienced that. And in a way, if you are using the forms as only a way to grade your students, I mean, they lose a lot of the appeal after you learn it because you really don't get any utility out of the form other than, you know, a new belt. Uh, for me, basically, I have, I have the want to take that form as an inspiration for what I need to actually um, attain and to develop. Uh, many other instructors would probably say, hey, you know, uh, when you actually do that skill, it needs to look exactly like that form. So in a video example, I mean, I, I, I would actually have, you know, many examples on YouTube. And when I'll come on and I go, hey, you know, hi, this is calling me from JDK. Today, we're actually doing an application from One Hill, for instance. And, and the, 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 the technique sequence looks like this. And then I go ahead and do this application, which looks nothing like the form, right? And um, myself and my student will have a, a little chuckle of it. And, and what people don't actually see is everything that goes behind the scenes to bring us to that point where we say that inspiration uh, that we got from that form has led, led us to play with it, to experiment with it, uh, break it down to different skills, pull it together, and then come up with an application that, hey, you know, uh, is appended to that form at that place, at that phrase, but doesn't always look exactly like the form. And I think people get confused because they're waiting for deliverance and the deliverance doesn't come very easily. And people often ask me, could you please tell me exactly where in the form that comes from? And I go, I showed it to you. And I'm going, well, you know, I showed it to you, but what I, I showed on video is only what I choose to show to you in that three to four minutes. There's, there's so many years of experience and insight and obviously um, of development that we've gone through that we, we haven't actually probably be able to communicate in that short amount of time. Um, so that's, that's one thing that basically is the, the, um, the disadvantage of having a video me medium in that it doesn't reflect what I, I bring to the table when I actually take a look at forms. And the biggest thing about forms for me, right, that the pivotal moment was um, when I, I, I happened on this quote from Chokimotobu. Do you, uh, do you know who Chokimotobu is? I don't. Chokimotobu is, uh, I think he's a 19th century, was it early 20th century? Sorry, sorry, he's a not, end of 19th century, early 20th century karateka from Okinawa. And he was a contemporary of Gichin Funakoshi, which is the father of uh, Japanese karate. And what Choki Motobu said was all he needed to fight was naihachi or teki, basically a form that I practice called choji, right? And choji is infamous because it is the simplest form that I know. It's got a, a very simple embusen, which is an, a floor plan. It's got maybe, I don't know, five or six moves each side mirrored. And for years, I practiced this form with this phrase from Chokimotobu, that, that quote saying, hey, you know, Naihanchi was the only form he needed. And I'm thinking to myself, how can he say that? And I'm like, yeah, for me as a thinking individual, I'm like going, how can the guy say that? And, and Choki Moto was known as a, as a fighter. He, he's basically known as a, a tough nut in Okinawa at his time. Whereas Gucci Purnakoshi was known as a, a, a very uh, upstanding gentleman, a teacher. Choki Motobi was known as a person you don't actually mess around with. So I'm here, you know, as a young black belt, I'm thinking, I've got a really huge amount of skills. Or, that, you know, I thought I was. I was hot stuff then. I've got this form, but nothing corresponds to my understanding of this form. And that has plagued me for at least two decades, right? 
So when I, I, I started um, from 2000 to 2003 looking and, and analyzing my forms, I kept on going to that one form. And one of the key things that happened to me very, very early on was that there was a there was a symmetry to the form. Obviously, it's, it basically has very simple movements. Basically, it's mirrored on, on both sides. And for me, I was saying, there's a huge symmetry in the movement. And when I take a, when I kind of squint and take a jaundiced look at it, I'm like, going, that symmetry looks as though it could be applied to a stripe that's coming from either the left or the right. And I go, crikey, mate. That's something in which I never thought of. I'm able to now defend myself with this technique. If the guys... Hmm. And in fact, if I guess wrong, it basically corrects itself. And I was like, man, that is so cool, isn't it? And from there on, I go, where else in my patterns is this reflected? So that set me on um, a huge paradigm shift. Prior to that, basically, I was like trying to append my skills to the technique sequence. And I had a spreadsheet. I started listing it out. And eventually, basically, it, it, was, it was a limiting approach because all I could list was the stuff that I already knew. I couldn't take inspiration for the form. The forms wouldn't inspire me until that point. When basically the form, as in the mnemonic device, said to me, hey, I'm trying to show you a way of analyzing the world. I'm trying to make it easy for you. And that was when JDK was born. JDK wasn't born by me setting up a club and pulling people in. JDK was born for me saying, crikey, I've got ways in which to help my cluttered and confused thoughts. And I am able to share ways in which to think that could actually probably help people, you know, with their ability to um, defend themselves, which is such an amazing thing. And I said, you know, um, certainly that's something in which I need to use as a way to um, help me with my search on, on explaining what the forms had for me. Uh, and then, you know, a decade or two later, basically right now in 2019, what I do is, when I look at a form, I'm not really looking at the form. I'm, I'm trying to look at the person behind the form prompting me and whispering to me, saying, hey, there's better ways of doing it. We, we, we are just human. We have some skills and we are trying to make those skills work for us, right? And... Uh, um, uh, many other people that I know do much better uh, work pulling together huge books, uh, explaining the, the forms and how they work. And for me, basically, sometimes I, as a lens, trying to, to justify the forms. Basically, for me, I, you know, talk in snippets. I try to pull together and make sense of the world in, in, in my estimation. And I have... Um, kind of a nice approach in that, you know, I, I, I don't think that I overly tax my students. I have this idea that um, the hard style martial arts were the Krav Maga of the day. They have some strengths. Their strengths are in blitzing. Their strengths are in uh, a narrow bandwidth of solutions to shut down an opponent. Beyond that, we have quite a number of holes in our training. And there are things in which we have to do to actually try. That's a sophisticated way of saying, hey, my top, top 10 popular techniques are this. And the way in which we do it is like this because our training makes sense. It makes sense for our training to actually link together uh, some techniques in this manner. And, and it makes uh, sense for us for, as practitioners to then pull it together really quickly and flow with it, right? You've just unpacked a tremendous amount of stuff and stuff that I suspect some of the listeners are going to go back and <laughs> listen to again, which is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. And before we, we start to look forward, you know, one more question about the past. Because again, when, when we have someone on the show who's done something differently than most, I, I, like to, I like to dig in a little bit. 
And you had been teaching for a little while before you went back to this kind of simplified approach, this more fundamental approach. Mm. Mm. Can you mm. speak to the progress, the effective progress of your students before and after that transition? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I have actually been reflecting on this quite often uh, because I, I do cross-train with a number of different schools. Uh, and in fact, one, instant, uh, one instance, one of the instructors who left for holiday uh, asked me to take over his class. And when he came back, he goes, oh, hey, Master Wee, my students love you. They love your classes. They had so much fun. And I go, um, you know, there is no chance that I'll be able to take over your class for a good amount of time because I was actually really struggling. I, what I did was I focused on your syllabus, your techniques. I, I used your black belts as examples. I tried to basically make the class fun, but really I was trying to train them with your techniques in mind and with their ability to follow those techniques. In my training, basically, um, right now, we follow the pattern. We do some kihon or kibon work. Uh, we do some line drills, but from there, the drills basically take a life of their own. Uh, we do what would be um, mirroring uh, the uh, um, kind of like a collaborative sparring. We work on two man drills. We look at application. We basically look at um, playing around and ad libbing often. So when I first started training, the, 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 the students I produced were hard style practitioners that were great with punching and kicking, some takedowns. Uh, you know, uh, some ability to recover when, when they're uh, in a stand-up clinch. Uh, but by and large, really, they, they would find um, advantages and strengths in blitzing of their opponents in gap closing. Currently, one of the things that I do greatly is a randori that I call uh, super light. Super light is a non-contact, and, and I, I don't want to diminish the semi-contact or the non-contact or the hard contact environment or scenarios which we, we, we open up in sparring. But the Rendori that I use basically is a non-contact sparring encounter in which there's a level of collaboration and understanding between the two opponents. It is still a, a, a striking base close quarter type scenario, but we try to use it in a way in which we can use lethal techniques in a very safe manner in which we're reducing the speed of our techniques. We are still moving around. We are still almost touching the opponent. But what we're trying to also deal with is we're trying to deal with an opponent that's actively non-compliant and stopping us to the best of his ability at maybe a a 60 to 70% speed. The whole idea being is that we want to focus on the technique. We want to focus on new techniques or stuff in which we want to fine tune. And at the same time, we want to be able to understand what we need to do whilst the opponent is actively uh, opposing what we're trying to do. So saying that we, uh, we focus in on a lot of sensitivity, we focus in on a of distancing, the center line, we, we look at slipping, bobbing, we look at, um, it's not dead zones, but blind spots, we look at coverage, and um, rather than a quick gap closing uh, strike, continue on a blitz type technique, what we, we, we try to do with, the, with this Randori approach is to continue the techniques and basically keep continuing. There's no winners, there's no losers. There's basically the, only the opportunity to learn. And with that, then that is uh, a part uh, of the inspiration we use to then return back to the applications and say, what exactly has our insights shown us with the applications that we use? Is it, is it still correct? 
is there any new things that we can come up with? It, does this application still hold? What happens when we're blocked? Can we recover? Well, how do we recover? What are the things that we need to do to actually recover? And certainly, um, it's very different from the hard start where it's, for lack of a better term, basically, it's, it's kind of like a point start sparring system where you are trying to, to, to nail the, the opponent with strikes very quickly, trying to back away and trying to re repeat that. Whereas in the, the Rendori, really, it is the fodder in which I, I need to understand the applications and you know, it, to, to work backwards from there, the technique sequences and the patterns that we have. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like a cycle that we, we, um, we have a, a, in, our, in our practice that an application may be a, a fairly good lesson beginning of 2018, but at the beginning of 2019, maybe it has modified a little bit, it's changed slightly because we've actually experienced different insights. Uh, we tend to use other things, so basically with the fit that it has, we tend to see it in a different way. And obviously, also it's, it's influenced by the people that are training with us. If, if the, the student group is less skilled, we focus on different applications, we focus on a different level of unfolding and unpacking that application. So therein is, a, is a, a, a huge distinction between my early students and the students that I train nowadays, where my students before would actually be trained fairly similar to the way that I, I was trained. Uh, and currently, I think that the, the practice that we have allows me to more fully immerse myself with the lessons that were given, given to me by my teachers. So I, I don't say that I, I'm doing something that is totally alien and foreign to what I've learned in the States or in Singapore for that matter. What I'm saying is that I feel as though I'm maximizing the concepts, the skills, and really the insight that was shared with me when I was younger. And I, I'm trying to unfold it to the best of my advantage or to the best of my ability. Right on. Let's Sorry, am I losing you a little bit? Not it's, a, it, not it's, at all. A, not at it's just all. going on and stuff. on a little bit, I think. Yeah. I, I, oh, good. Hey, I, good. I told you up front, that's, that's the best part about this show is, is when people start to wander around. Uh, that's when we get into the good stuff. But let's look into the future now. If you look out over the next however many years, five years, 10 years, 40 yep. years, whatever, whatever you want to look out, yep. what's coming down the pipe? You know, what's, what are you looking at? for goals and for motivation for you and your students and your school and, and everything else? My goals basically don't stop from at five or 10 years. Basically, I have projected all the way to retirement with my martial arts. And the reason being is that it'll always be with me. And I, I'm, I'm sure the listeners and yourself will probably be um, understanding this as well. It has been a part of my life since I was young. And even if I get my legs blown off or, you know, if I get debilitated in some way, um, I can still engage with the martial arts in different roles and different ways. And basically the, the, the layers of the onions are, are, are still there for me to enjoy. Um, my retirement plan basically is to hopefully travel the world and to provide seminars to like-minded martial arts schools who would like to understand a little bit about the um, approach and the analysis to the forms and to play around with a different lens to traditional uh, style training. Uh, Jun Du Kwan basically means school of the middle way. School of the middle way meaning that we are situated at a crux between the precursors of our art and also innovations in the modern era. I want to not fixate myself on uh, a traditional system to the, the mutual exclusion of innovations in sports sciences, for instance. So where I come in, basically, I don't want to be so uh, one-eyed to say, hey, you know, everything all is great. What I want to say is, at this moment in time, what is of greatest relevance to 
traditional taekwondo. What is what is important for Junjo Kwon to be? Uh, and I, I'm not afraid to actually change and shift that goalpost. So as as retirement goes, I, I want to obviously, hopefully, fingers crossed, be in a business which allows me to travel the world, meet up with friends, do what I like, and you know, basically hang back and enjoy, you know, this this passion that I have, really living the dream, right? Uh, beforehand, uh, I. I see JDK continuing, JDK under me will continue to be a small practice. I don't see it growing. If it does grow, it grows because of the auspices of my students. Uh, I've got a few black belts and associate black belts. Uh, if they take up the mantle, if they uh, set up a retail school, I would love to support them. I would love to see them grow and, and do something which uh, makes sense to their plans. But for me, I have benefited with smaller classes. I know that's not how I wanted to start up with. Started, you know, I, when I started up, I, I thought, hey, you know, I would love to have a, a really decent sized club. Uh, I, I would like to actually grow it, maybe even change it and, and uh, use it as a business opportunity. But that hasn't been the way that it has unfolded for me. So JDK, I think, continues to be a, a small uh, group of uh, a mix of, of students. And what really it does, it, 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 it performs a role in my community. It brings together other martial artists, other schools, other students in cross-training opportunities, in seminars, in social activities. Uh, certainly, um, there are opportunities and uh, things in which I'm trying to build up right now. Uh, about 20 years ago, I, I, I met up with Stuart Anslow, who is a Taekwondo instructor from the UK, and he inspired me to uh, join this organization that he was starting, uh, IOMAS, which is International Alliance of Martial Arts Schools. IOMAS basically was a student support mechanism where students who were traveling were able to uh, train for free for up to two weeks at any participating member school. and. Um, Long story short, I have taken the mantle, and I've probably run it to the ground a little bit, but IOMA still has representation in, in Western Australia. We still have a fairly good community here. Next year, I'm planning a fairly large conference for IOMA schools. We are looking at uh, practical workshops through the day. We're looking at industry representation. Uh, we're also trying to use it, and this is, it's still in the planning stage, but because I'm, I'm the one planning it, I get to actually, I actually get to say what I want to do. And, and what I really want to accomplish is to use it to promote uh, health and wellness, basically mental wellness in the community um, and um, seeing the, the role that martial arts instructors can have in being the front face of uh, kind of uh, the first phase of dealing with mental health issues or basically a support mechanism whereby there are people who are stretched by the 21st century, by business needs, by their financial uh, uh, expectations. And what we can do is we have uh, training, we have practice, uh, we have uh, a support mechanism that is able to um, go beyond doing Kihon or competitions or sparring. I mean, we can be more than that. Organizations are always more than that. Or what we would like to do is we would like to prompt people to actually uh, encompass uh, this approach so that they know that, you know, in our community, we are not just martial arts schools that uh, are, are in co-opetition. We're not trying to steal your students. We are standing up for something bigger than ourselves and we can come together as a community and do good things and accomplish things that we couldn't do singularly. Um, uh, certainly, I would like to actually say that uh, if you, you know, occupy a small corner of the world, that's what you, you experience. If you stretch yourselves, you'll find that there are other individuals with 
uh, the same passions, same like-minded, obviously the same fears of meeting uh, egomaniacs, of meeting difficult people in the industry. And, and certainly there are those individuals, but they are, in my experience, a very small part. They should not be, um, they should not be an excuse for us holding ourselves back and not sharing what we love with the community of martial artists and beyond of potential martial artists, right? Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. What if people want to find you online? How about websites and social media and all that? They can uh, search for Jungda Kwan, uh, Western Australia on, uh, on Facebook. They've got the ability to find me uh, under Colin Wee on YouTube, I suppose on Instagram. I do have uh, videos that I, I put up there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm actually really quite online. I'm quite accessible. Um, I do have a website. They can send me an email. There are people who communicate with me very often. I'm linked with um, IOMAS. I'm linked with the study of Taekwondo, which is a closed, sorry, a secret Facebook group of Taekwondo instructors throughout the world. So I do have... Uh, uh, a good place amongst various online groups and uh, when I do travel which is sometimes fairly often I actually meet up with them when I actually go around the world so uh, I do have instances where I have started conversations up online and then eventually meet and train and or socialize with people around the world which is a, a lovely experience I haven't as yet met a, a crazy serial killer uh, online. Uh, hopefully, I, I don't ever. But um, the martial artists I've met online have been great. Uh, they, it's very easy to tell the good ones from, from the bad ones. I, I do have the, the people who are asking me for certification. They do ask me for a, a letter of recommendation so that they can get a visa into this country. Uh, I do have people who basically want... Um, something from me like a rank certificate that I can't actually give them, you know, without a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. But uh, for uh, the experiences I have online, it's been really quite easy to actually spot those people who are really curious about what I do and also uh, are happy to share. And I think those are the, the instances where I, I, I enjoy the most, where people basically send me a message and say, hey, you know, I love what you've done. I've done the same thing and I want to show you what we've done. And those are, are, are amazing. And uh, it, it's, it puts a smile on my face because uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it calls up a, a shared understanding. Uh, certainly sometimes it's not uh, from the same lineage, but be, because you know, the lineages are sometimes very easy to compare. There's more similarities than dissimilarities within the martial arts, especially when we talk about hard styles. When we talk about soft styles, basically, that's when variances occur that, you know, I, I, I may find less of, uh, of uh, uh, the ability to compare and con on contrast. But with hard style martial artists, I have... Uh, I find really great similarities, even with karate practitioners uh, and with some Taekwondo uh, practitioners who are looking beyond the, the kicking skills that they have. They want to know, hey, what the, the, the patterns have for them? Why do I actually interpret it in this way? Uh, why don't you actually interpret it in another way? And I go, you know, hey, you know, uh, I do this because of a decision-making framework or I approach it in this way. So if you actually consider that and then consider what you have then we can play around with a range of different things and in fact uh, come up with similar results or very similar results and <laughs> and results that in fact may be dissimilar but may actually benefit your practice uh, as much as what I've done benefits mine so yes they can find me online we uh, I'm happy to chat and um, I'm also happy for them to meet other people that I know uh, through me and uh, continue the conversation there. Well, I appreciate your time. And we'll love to ask just one more thing as, as we head out the door. Why don't you send us out? Sure, Jeremy. What parting words would you give to the people listening today? My parting words would probably be the first lesson that I would give a beginner 
I welcome a beginner to my dojo or my mat space and we bow in at the door. We bow in at the mat, then we come onto the mat. And one of the key lessons is etiquette. You know, basically it says karate always begins with the bow. The first ten of taekwondo is courtesy. And I go, what is, what is etiquette? Etiquette is, is a list of rules in which we set so that you comply with it and then you can forget it. We basically set it so that there are an opportunity in which we can, at the door, when we bow and we leave our worldly baggage outside, we step into the dojo or dojang ready to actually focus. When we bow at the mat, we come in, we acknowledge that training and, and respect that training area for more than just the physical location it occupies. And what that allows us to do is it, it helps us um, optimize our space and our role and our position within the, the training sphere that I create. The, the environment in which I create is of vital importance because I want to optimize their ability to deal with stress. Obviously, as they grow in my system, they basically grow as individuals, deal with stress, and optimize their tactical um, uh, performance with it. And these lessons basically are beyond singular techniques. They're beyond the road learning of patterns. And I think is the most important thing that I would say differentiates us from other organizations that don't do a competitive sport uh, or traditional martial art training. And I think in the 21st century, I would say that this is the way to level up. You have students coming to you. They have stresses in their life, growing up, dealing with performance, anxiety, stresses. And these organizations are not able to deal with um, their needs as individuals, uh, their ability to deal with stress. Uh, their ability to succeed in life and also be balanced um, individuals, right? And I think that in terms of advice is that we got to stop thinking solely of the system. We got to stop being in that corner of the world and focus on the needs of the students. I mean, that's what really defines what the martial arts is to me. It's no longer, hey, you know, it's not, it's not a fight. Obviously, we learn fighting skills. And if you want to actually acid test me, sure. But that's a very, very narrow way of, of defining ourselves. You know, stepping up towards the 21st century, there's many things, screen time, health, wellness, financial issues. All of these basically are, are I would say, non-sustainable. You... you you have these stresses and you are not able to deal with them. And then you get you know, suicide, depression, um, uh, poor health, sedentary uh, uh, lifestyles that basically don't prepare you for, for aging. Whereas the martial arts has a huge amount of potential to look at the person and say, what can we do to level this guy up? And I think you know, anyone in their right minds would understand that that's where it's, it, it's at for us. We've got a passion for the martial arts. If we stretch out with two like-minded individuals and say, what can we do for the community, for individuals who need that helping hand? We've got answers that other organizations can never communicate or can never transmit. And I think that's a lovely way to actually end off this, this interview in that it's, you know, not what happened in the 18th century, 19th century. It's not Japan or Korea. Let's, let's not talk about what happened, you know, 150 years ago or 200 years ago. Let's talk about what we, we need now, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's my take on things, Jeremy. I really appreciated the things that Master Wee had to say. We got into some stuff that, let's be honest, we haven't heard before. I'm both surprised and not that here we are, 448 episodes in, that we're still learning new information from our guests. And that's why we keep the show going, because there's still more to learn. There are still different perspectives. 
and I appreciate hearing from all these different people. We certainly could have spent longer talking, and actually, we did talk for a bit after we closed the show. So, thank you, Master Wee, for your kindness and for talking to me and coming on the show. Listeners, if you want to know more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, find episode 448, and check out everything we've got from Master Wee, from photos to links to everything else. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there. And if you want to show your support, share this episode, make a purchase at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, or leave us a review somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to email me, I'm Jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media is at whistlekick all over the place. I'm done for now. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. (laughs) 